The last time we had a look at high relations between the Church of Ireland, the Presbyterian Church and the Catholic Church had developed in the 17th and 18th centuries. We looked how revolutionary ideas, both at home and abroad, had culminated in the United Irish Man Rebellion. And we examined briefly the role of Bartholomew Tilling in the, what's called the Year of the French, when a belated French landing at Kalala Bay tried to finish off the work of the United Irishmen. In actual fact, in real terms, following the battles of Vinegar Hill and Maxford, in Antrim and in Saintfield, the United Irishman Rebellion proved to be a costly failure, both in terms of finance and in terms of loss of life. With 30,000 people killed, it was the biggest rebellion in terms of loss of life ever on Irish soil. This could not have been anticipated by Sir Arthur Chichester back when he started the early plantations at the beginning of the 17th century. The building that you see is an indication that Settlement was sparse and not, ex not uh, 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 prosperous in, in any way. He says in his diary, uh, Arthur Chichester said that upon divers other parts of the Lord Deputy's land there are many English families, some Scots and divers civil Irish planted and there are three mills already built. Now English, Scots and you'll notice civil Irish which means Irish who didn't seem to pose a problem either in their religion or their disposition to English rule. So a certain amount of integration happened. Arthur Chichester of course could never have anticipated the, th the, the great changes that occurred in his own family and in the lands they controlled and the lands controlled by the Conways out in Lisburn in the following centuries. One development of course was that the Chichesters didn't stay in Ireland all the time. The Marquis of Chichester, Marcus Donegal, moved to Fisherwick in, in Staffordshire, from which we get Fisherwick Place. But many of those who did come to Ireland in the 19th century were to make it home and were to make a, make a success of their life there. This is William McCants, and he his family owned both Callan Glen and Mackenzie's Glen, between the Stewartstown and Glen Roads leading up to Hannestown. He was born in 1746. Very important there because at this stage uh, the Church of Ireland were still the dominant religious group in Ireland generally. They were the main components of the Protestant ascendancy. But Mackenz himself was a Presbyterian from Scotland, as many in the Dunmurray area were. He belonged to the Dunmurray non-subscribing congregation, which didn't take the Westminster of Confession of Faith and believed in the centrality of freedom of conscience. He had a bleach green at Balakalu and Kilwee and lived at Suffolk House. We have no idea to the present day why it was called Suffolk House, whether it was a connection, a family connection to Suffolk in England. It is doubtful that this was the case, unless it was part of the wife's family or relations family, they were solidly from Scotland. But they were 
representative of a new type of immigrant. Coming over because land was available in this area, it was quite cheap to rent, uh, labour to work on linen, which is very labour intensive at all times, was very cheap and there was no patent right to pay for the inventions of Compton, Hargreaves and Arkwright which had been adopted but which had mechanised the cotton industry around Manchester and Oldham and the various cotton towns, Rochdale and so on, of England, Manchester and Lancashire. In 1797 he had renewed a release from the Marquis of Donegal which had been taken out in 1736. He himself died in 1810 and he died just as surprisingly enough the Act of Union which would really been designed to suppress trouble in Ireland started to make some aspects of Irish society especially in the North East an economic success Be because McKent's and so many like him were to make a success of flax growing and linen manufacture just on the cusp of mechanisation. Like families like the Grimshaws and the Charlies, they had came over as entrepreneurs in the 18th century. Like them too, they were to put up big houses to live in in the sparsely populated area between Lisbon and Belfast. So sparsely populated that streets didn't exist. Houses, what there was of them, tended to have names rather than street numbers. An examination of the fortunes of one of his sons gives us an indication of how Ireland was to change at that time. The picture you see of John McKent's Member of Parliament and the information beside, this, beside him tells us a lot about how Ireland was developing. He himself was born in 1772 and lived at Roselands. Roseland stands to the present day, it, is between, it stands beside the tennis and bowling club, which is on the main Anderson's Town Road, right beside the Wolf and Whistle, which used to be the White Fort Bar. The name's still on it, Roselands. Uh, the families who were to be comprised the Linen Lords, one of whom were the Finleys. He married Maria Finlay in 1799. Like himself, she was a Presbyterian. As were the Russells who were to take over Roseland earlier and an intermarried with the Charlie family, but they were Church of Ireland. When Maria, Maria died in 1801, he married Jane Russell. And this is a process we see replicated by the large and successful linen families who are headed by usually a head of family and tend to be regarded, sorry, to be called linen lords. In 1813, for example, he married Sarah Law, with whom he had ten children. So he had moved to Suffolk, he grew, lived in most of his life there, he wasn't born there. He was a keen huntsman and a, had a pack of hounds. This would have been in common with all the other linen lords of the time. The Charlie family, who would have lived around the Finnicky area. The Sinklers, who were, Sinkler family, who would have lived around Dunmurray, gone down to Dunbeg, who had endowed uh, that, the church in Derrybeg, the Dunbeg. Uh, the Hunters, who would have lived at Ballycaloo, of uh, what is now the, uh, 
the Ray Dunmurray. And he had became an MP and he died in 1835. But his relationship to both work and to the Marquis of Donegal's family is very important here. This family gave a stained glass window to the meeting house in Dunmurray, which is still there to the present day. It shows the Cullen River, which ran right through Cullen Glen and Mackenzie's Glen and does to the present day, and it is the source of their wealth. It stands beside areas like Twin, uh, Dairy Farm, like Glenwood Farm, like Laurel Bank Farm, which give their names now to the Dairy Farm Shopping Centre and the various estates, some of the estates that go to comprise Pole Glass. He was, an, he was a Presbyterian of independent mind and he was not particularly impressed by the second Marquis of Donegal. Whereas the first Marquis of Donegal had been an absentee, living in uh, uh, living in beside the, uh, the then linen hall, later the site of the city hall, he, uh, when he was in Belfast, he contributed generously, first Marquis of Donegal, to the prosperity of Belfast. He paid, for example, largely £60,000, a significant sum of money, for the development of the Lagan Canal. He gave the land for the first Catholic Church, St Mary's, and the first Marquis of Donegal also gave the land to Clifton Street Poor House, which opened in 1776. He was a philanthropist and a benefactor. Very unlike the man with whom John McCants uh, had the personal relationships. That's the second Marquis of Donegal. And he had actually was something of a, a, a weaker figure than his father, let me say. He had married his wife of the May family, Sir uh, Stephen May's daughter, while he was in Fleet Street Prison for debt. He inherited the second Marquis of Donegal, George Augustus, considerable amounts of money, and he went through it all. He was rather an extravagant spender. But he did two things. He built the first Ormo Park as his house. It would have been then seen as outside Belfast. We have not many photographs of it. We don't know much about it, but we know he put an awful lot of money into it. And it was replaced for the Donegal family by Belfast Castle in the 1860s. Ormo Park was to be Belfast's first public park when it was taken over from the Donegal family. But he was an inveterate gambler. And the second Marcus of Donegal, with his gambling habit, is believed to have gambled the water rights to Colin, the Colin River, and he lost it to John McCants. Hence, their prosperity. He, John McCants became a member of Parliament in 1835, and he was really at the patronage at that time of the second Marquis of Donegal. However, he didn't show him any loyalty. He believed the Marquis of Donegal uh, was only there because of birth, not because of ability. And he tended to vote very much in favour of liberal measures. They would have been, uh, they'd have given the land, for example, for the building of St Joseph's Catholic Church in Hallistown. They'd have built, put the money for an extension on it as well. They would have been, they would have been a family who integrated very well with locals. And one of the Mackenzies went off to fight at the Battle of Ballina Hinch with his, with 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 uh, one of the with a couple of the members of their f uh, uh, employees who were Catholics. So they shared ideas of progress. And this river would have run down through this area, the Colin River, all the rivers in the area, the Balakaloo and so on, all very important 
water power was how you really, it was the first form of mechanisation. After that, gas and much later, sort of, you know, steam power. And steam power, they were very sort of innovative. They used steam power in their, in their actual sort of factories and so on in the, in the colonist state, which is now sort of Anderson's town, Lanadoon area. This is the Rumbling Hole on the upper Cullen River. And it could become a torrent at times, providing much of their power. Still a beauty spot, still worth well, well, well visiting the Cullen and the Kent's Glens. But one of the things they also owned was a house Glenville, in the area of the present Carragart, a, a linked by a mill race as far as Suffolk House. And one of the sort of big sorrows we have, as we don't know about enough about this house, we know it was belonged to the McCann's family, we know that they intermarried with other big families, both, both Church of Ireland and Presbyterian, that they were certainly progressive in their past, and we know quite a lot because one of them, uh, John, uh, another John McCann's, wrote a history of the family firm. But this is Glenville on the present Carrick Art, part of Big House, well I suppose later, Unionism, but a very significant development in the area of Colin. The Colin River Valley, this gives you an idea of how extensive, how important it is today. But perhaps even more significantly is how these early lords gave so much now that we take for granted but we have no idea of their actual origin. This is part of the uh, Malone Golf Club and was once part of Bally Drain, the seat of the Sinclair family, who are significant in many ways. They were very, very big linen manufacturers. Drumbeg Church they owned and actually uh, sort of expanded as part of a, a marriage deal, a, a promise made. And there, the graveyard at Drumbeg is a great source of historical information from the various families like the Charlie family, the McKenzie's and the Sinklers who intermarried so much. But part of the legacy we have today is this Malone Golf Club once belonged to Millment, which was their family home. They were an extraordinarily innovative family. And one of the big things that one of them did uh, was, he was one of the Stuarts went to New York, Alexander Turnley Stuart, where he opened the first department store in Manhattan in New York City, selling everything at a set price, which is how department stores do it throughout the world today. But he was the first to innovate. And they he also uh, organised things like catalogue systems. He was the sixth richest man in America. And his department store was situated between Reed Street, R-E-I-D-E, and Chambers Street. Also two important members of the early uh, congregation at the Dunmurray Meeting House, probably named after them and also linen manufacturers. But the Kent McCancers and people like that were to be some of the wealthiest people in the North, holding political, social and artistic rules in Northern society. How well their buildings were built is indicated by this. This is part of the early factory and in and around Suffolk village really. The houses still stand, but this was taken over by a bacon factory for a long time. But in the early days, it was an employer of, 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 of locals in the linen industry, by what could only be regarded as a liberal family for its time. The picture, as you see, I think it, it, it was only demolished in the 1990s or so, stood for a hundred years. And really what was essentially agricultural land. One of the things that I found striking about the time was that the census rules of 18, 1901 tell us about Pole Glass and Twinbrook, 
that pool glass, and it's a massive area, all sorts of townlands, had only 191 inhabitants on the census roll, most of whom were Church of Ireland, then next to number Presbyterians, and a small number thereafter of Catholics, perhaps 34. Twinbrook had only, then Caliton had only 74 people. Largely again Church of Ireland and Presbyterians with a handful of Catholics. The situation of course was to change after the Second World War when the Blitz, the German bombing of 1941 of April and May was to, was to not only cause great loss of life and destruction of housing and prep factory, but was to establish that the housing stock was inadequate. And after the Second World War, new land was vested, starting in the Seymour Hill area, named after, of course, the Conway family, who were also called Seymour. Uh, the house actually belonged to the Charlie family, and it, it was allowed to stand, and still stands today, as a block of individual flats, six, six flats for people. Uh, living in the Seymour Hill greater area. At the area of the head from Woodburn of course too settled with various people uh, from around the Sandy no Low area and moving on later to the overcrowded areas which were to comprise uh, in inner city Belfast which were to comprise most of the inhabitants of first of all Twinbrook and later Pole Glass with various political arguments about how many houses there should be in between times. <laughs>